each type of reciprocity had its place in time. And learning how to use it wisely is crucial for any successful negotiator. Additionally, we'll delve into how the Socratic method, based on asking questions, complements reciprocity by fostering open and constructive dialogue. Through carefully selected questions, you can gain valuable information, demonstrate empathy, and guide the other party toward mutual understanding and beneficial social agreement. This approach not only helps you build relationships, but also positions you as a shrewd and considerate negotiator. We will also learn how important it is to balance each exchange by making sure that every kind act or concession is returned. This balance is not only fair, but also necessary for keeping personal and business strategies. They will change not only how to talk about people in business or conversation, but also how to treat people in your personal life. Every example and piece of information we give you is meant to give you power, give you toll you need to succeed, and help you to understand that the key to success in negotiation is being able to give, receive, and balance well. Come with us as we break those rules down and show you how to use them to reach and go beyond your goals. First, we'll talk about the rules of reciprocity, which is one of the most interesting and useful ideas in negotiation. This idea is easy but very important. Anyone who does something nice for you will naturally want to do something nice for you back. It's a strong force that you can learn to control to get better at both negotiating and getting along with other people. Imagine you are in a negotiation at the beginning. Both sides present their demands and expectations, which is normal. However, the moment you decide to take a generous step without an immediate request and return, you change the dynamics of entire interaction. By doing so, you not only show good faith, but also establish a precedent of generosity that can motivate the other party to respond similarly. But why does reciprocity work? According to studies in social psychology, people have an innate inclination to balance the skills, to not owe something to someone. This is because the feeling of being in debt to someone can create discomfort and stress in the context of a negotiation. When someone receives something without an immediate condition in return, this psychological needs to balance the relationship is activated, leading to a desire for reciprocity. Of course, this idea must be used in an honest and moral way. It's not about tricking people, it's about building relationships based on trust and respect. People in a negotiation are more likely to come to a deal that works for both sides if they feel like they're being treated with respect and care. This role also has an effect that builds over time. Under the principle of reciprocity, the more time you interact with someone, the better your relationship will be and the easier it will be to go into future deals. It is important to remember that exchange doesn't always have to happen right away. Sometimes, like we are in a long-term business relationship, acts of kindness we do today may be returned weeks, months, or even years later. If you want to use this idea in your negotiation strategies, you need to think about the long term and learn how to be patient. Moreover, it's crucial to recognize that reciprocity can manifest in many ways, not just through material or financial exchanges. Emotional reciprocity, such as verbal recognition, expression of gratitude, or ever even empathy shown during a difficult conversation can be equally powerful. These gestures may not have monetary value, but the emotional and psychological value they create in negotiation can be immense. Likewise, it's important to be strategic and considerate about when and how you use reciprocity. It's not simply about giving with the expectation of receiving something in return. It's about understanding and responding to the needs and desire of other party in, in, in a way that naturally invites reciprocity. This could mean tolerating your acts of reciprocity to other people based on what you know about their value, needs, and top goals. By using the law of reciprocity in your talks and negotiation, you're not only working towards a better agreement, but you're also setting the stage for future interaction that will be good. By doing this, you show that you care about relationships and you're ready to put time and effort into them in a useful way. This is important not only for negotiating well, but also for building a trustworthy and respected image of yourself, of your business. With these tips, I hope you can use that laws of reciprocity is more than just a way to negotiate. It's also a way of thinking about how to deal with others that, when used correctly and with integrity, can lead to a lot of success and opportunities. As we continue our look at the power of reciprocity and negotiation, we will look at two specific types of reciprocity that can we use to make our relationship stronger and your chances of success in any deal better. These are exchanged in terms of money and feelings. Both are important and work together to make place where people 
value each other and work together first. Let's talk about emotional reciprocity. This type of reciprocity focuses on intangible exchanges that directly affect how the people involved in negotiation feel. Gestures like showing genuine appreciation, sincerely thanking someone, or even expressing admiration for the other party's work ethics are all examples of emotional reciprocity. These acts may seem small, but their impact on the negotiation environment is enormous. By making people feel valued or respected, we create fertile ground for cooperation and empathy, which facilitates reaching a cons consensus. Emotional reciprocity is especially effective because it touches on the basic human desire to be recognized and appreciated. When people feel that their efforts and time are valued, they're more willing to listen and consider your viewpoint and needs. Additionally, this type of reciprocity can help overcome moments of tension and build bridges where there were previously barriers. For example, in a difficult negotiation as simple, I understand and appreciate your concerns can change the tone of entire conversation and pave the way for more productive dialogue. On the other hand, we have material or tangible reciprocity, which involves physical or concrete exchanges. This could include, for example, making a concession on a concrete term, offering better payment condition, or even providing additional service at no extra cost. This type of reciprocity is very direct and often what people expect in a negotiation. However, the timing and manner in which is offered are crucial. It should be perceived as a gesture of goodwill and not as an attempt to buy or bribe, which could damage the trust instead of threatening it. Material exchange need to be used in a planned way, giving without expecting anything. In return isn't the point. The point is to know when and how to make a gift that will make other person want to do the same. If you're a negotiating a contract and know that the other party is worried about cash flow, for example, giving more flexible payment terms could be a nice thing to do. The other party might then respond by making concessions in other par parts of the agreement. Being authentic is a key part of handling both emotional and material reciprocity. Whether they are physical or emotional, gestures might be sincere and show that the person is trying to build a connection, not just get what they want. Being honest builds trust, and trust is the basis for good talks. Integrating both types of reciprocity also involves a deep understanding of the other party's needs and desires. Part of your preparation for any negotiation should be researching and understanding what your counterparts value most, whether it's emotional recognition or material benefits. This understanding will allow you to personal your gesture of reciprocity in a way that's both more effective and more appreciated. Additionally, it's important to remember that reciprocity is not always immediate. In some negotiations, especially those that are long-term, the fruits of your goodwill gesture may take time to manifest. However, when done sincerely, these acts establish a solid foundation for a continuous relationship that can yield mutual benefit over time. It's like a coin. Emotional and financial gifts go hand in hand. Both are necessary to negotiate well and build relationships that last and work well. Skillfully and thoughtfully, using these forms of reciprocity will not only help you reach better agreements, but it will also build respect and appreciation for each other that goes by beyond a discussion table. I'm going to show you the Socratic method, which is old but useful still way to negotiate that stood the test of time. This method, which is a build and talking and coming up with questions, can change the course of your negotiation in a big way. Today, we are going to talk about how you can use this method to improve your relationship and get better results. The Socratic method, named after the Greek philosopher Socrates, is fundamentally a process of inquiry and discussion between individual and opposing opinions. Based on asking questions to stimulate critical thinking and illuminate ideas. In the context of negotiation, this method not only serves you gather information, but also helps build relationships, facilitate understanding, and foster creative solutions. To begin using the Socratic method in negotiation involves asking open-ended questions that prompts the other party to think and reveal more about their true concerns and needs. These questions should be designed to go deeper than superficial answer and should help uncover the underlying motivates behind the other party's positions. Effective use of Socratic method also involves active listening to the response. Active listening is crucial because the answer you receive will power or provide the basis for your subsequent question, which should be delve deeper into the conversation and explore new areas of consensus or disagreement. These sequence of questioning and answering, when skillfully managed, can guide the parties toward a deeper understanding and often to solutions that meet the fundamental 
financial interests of both. Using the Socratic method to negotiate is also helpful because it helps people avoid arguments and better handle disagreements. You can make arguments less personal and less likely to turn violent by focusing the talk on questions and answers. This is very helpful in tense talks where feelings are high. And instead of saying what you want or attacking what the other person is offering, asking questions lets you think about what is possible and what is impossible without making any assumptions. This can help people work together better. The Socratic method also lets you decide how fast and where the discussion goes. You can subtly stir the talk forward issues or point to things are important without pushing your agenda directly by asking smart questions. This is a good way to lead the discussion and also make sure that both sides feel like they have a say in a discussion making progress. To use this method successfully, you need to plan ahead before the negotiation. This means making a list of questions based on what you know about the other person and being ready to change your question as talks goes on. You also need to keep an open mind and be ready to think about replies you get, which might make your change your mind about what's originally thought. When closing a negotiation or discussion using the Socratic method, it's helpful to summarize the key points that have been discussed and confirm the agreement that has been reached. The summary not only ensures that both parties have the same understanding, but also reinforces the relationship by showing a commitment to clarity or mutual satisfaction. The Socratic method is not just a question and answer technique. It's a deep and respectful approach that fosters mutual understanding and problem solving. By adopting this method in your negotiation, you not only improve your skill as a negotiator, but also elevate the quality of your interaction, resulting in more robust agreements and stronger relationships. Having explored the Socratic method, how it can enhance your negotiation skill by fostering deep and more meaningful dialogue. Let us now move on the other crucial concept of art of negotiation fairness. Fairness not only reinforces the effectiveness of our negotiation, but also plays an essential role in the perception of justice and in building lasting relationships. When people are negotiating, fairness means that everyone thinks the idea is fair for everyone. This idea is more just giving everyone a fair share of their resources. It means making sure that everyone feels like their wants and interests have been properly understood and respected. Fairness is very important because if people think a process is fair, these are more likely to follow through with the deal and less likely to cause problems later on. Being fair is also important for keeping business and personal relationship healthy over a long run. A negotiator who is seen as a fair and reasonable build as an image of trustworthiness, which is important for future dealing. Additionally, fairness encourages a helpful environment where people want to get the most out of both own and other benefits. To integrate fairness into your negotiation, start by understanding and acknowledging the other party needs and concerns. This may involve taking, taking the time to listen actively and ask about their goals, limitations, and priorities. Once you understand these aspects, you can propose solutions that not only meet your needs, but also effective address and interests of other party. Another strategy is to use the language of fairness during discussions. Phrases like, let's find a solution that's fair for both of us, or it's important to me that we both feel this agreement is equitable, can be very powerful. This type of language not only reinforces the idea that you care about fairness, but also sets a positive tone that can make a negotiation smoother. Moreover, when negotiating, it's helpful to consider the concept of a win-win approach. This approach seeks to create agreements where all parties involved gain significant benefits, contrary to notion of win-lose. When one party wins and expense of the other, a win-win approach ensures that each party walks away feeling satisfied, reinforcing the perception of fairness and fostering long-term relationship. But it's important to be reasonable, giving everyone the exact time and exact thing is always fair instead. Being fair means giving everyone why they need to be happy within the limits of what is possible and acceptable. Both sides may have to give in and change some things, both but these changes should be made in a way that keeps things fair and show respect for each other. In addition, it's important to be honest about your goals and the information you share. Hiding information or changing small detail can make people think the other people isn't fair enough, which can hurt the long-term relationship. Being honest is not only the right thing to do, it's also useful because it keeps people from misinterpreting things and 
fighting again. Fairness isn't just a nice thing to have in negotiation. It's a must for any relationship to work unless focusing on fairness will have you reach a fair agreement as, as well as open the door and new possibilities and build trust in the relationship in the next negotiation. Make sure that the, the principle of fairness guides your choice and action so that every deal is not only good for both sides but also deeply fairly moving forward with the keys to successful negotiation. It's also crucial to address another fundamental principle never leave without receiving something in return. This concept far from prompting a selfish or calculating mindset underscores the importance of balance and mutual value in the interaction. Let's delve into how this principle can be applied effectively to ensure that every transaction is beneficial for all parties involved. In the context of a negotiation, it's sometimes tempting to offer consensus and advantages without asking for anything in return, especially when trying to establish a good relationship or impress the other party. However, this approach can lead to an imbalance that, in the long term, could undermine both your position and the respect an other party has for you. The key is to ensure that for everything you offer, you receive something of comparable value in return. This is not only maintains the fairness of the deal, but also reinforces the perception that both sides are equitably committed to a relationship. How can we ensure that we know and communicate the value of your contribution and be aware of what you're willing to accept in return? By entering a negotiation with a clear understanding of your assets and needs, you will be better equipped to negotiate exchanges that reflect a true balance of value. For example, if you're offering an extension on payment terms, consider what you can request and return to compensate for the flexibility. It could be a higher purchase value or perhaps more favorable delivery condition. The important thing is that the final deal reflects an equitable exchange of consensus that benefits both parties. This rule also applies to the material and mental exchange. We talked about earlier every act of kindness, honesty, and offer to work together should be seen as one of the number of interactions that makes the relationship stronger. Making sure that every action has a matching response is not only building an agreement, but also a relationship based on respect and commitment. And following the rule of never give without receiving keeps people from feeling like they're barely they're being taken of advantage. This is especially important during long-term talks and relationship where keeping the balance is a key to the partnership's success. In order to keep this balance, both sides must be willing to talk to each other honestly and openly, as well as willing to adopt the other person's changing needs and make sure the exchange always goes both ways. It is important to remember that getting something in return doesn't always mean getting something you useful right away. Sometimes what you get is an invest in a long-term condition. For example, you might build trust and learn more about the other person's needs and abilities. These feelings can be seen and touched or be very valuable, leading to a new opportunities and making future talks easier, bigger, and more complicated. Remember, the goal of this principle is not to win in every interaction, but also to ensure that each party feels valued and committed to the relationship by, by balancing what you give and what you receive. You're laying the groundwork for fruitful and lasting cooperation based on mutual respect and shared benefits. As you move forward in your negotiation encounter, care with your principle of never giving without receiving. This approach will help and build more robust and equitable agreements and position you as ethical and effective negotiator. By maintaining this balance, you not only ensure success in current dealings, but also lay the foundation for future successful negotiations. Before concluding our episode today, I want to remind you why the principle we have explored are so fundamental to negotiating or discussing success successfully each, each aspect you have analyzed. From emotional and material reciprocity to use of the Socratic method are not just isolated techniques, they are part of comprehensive approach to achieving success in your negotiation. This success, of course, is not measured by only by immediate outcome of a deal, but by the quality and durability of the relationship you build in process. By following these rules, you will not only be able to close a good deal, but also be building a relationship based on mutual respect and teamwork that can lead to a future chance and long-term benefits. Negotiation is an art of gets better without practice and through thoughts. Every exchange is a chance to use what you've learned and change how you act based on people are talking in the, in the solution. Always keep an open mind and think about both your needs and needs of the other person. This way, you can make sure that every deal is based on a real understanding and mutual satisfaction. Each of the ideas we've talked about today has the power to change the way you negotiate an extension, your personal and kindness relationship. You can become a better negotiator 
and help build a culture of response and cooperation by focusing on reciprocity, asking smart questions and get to bottom up things and always trying to be fair. I hope that we will talk about today has given your idea and your tools that will help you in a future talks. Do not forget that consistent practice and commitment to these principles are key to your development or success. We invite you to leave a comment for your negotiation experience or any question you have about what we discussed today. Your feedback is invaluable to us and helps us improve your brain content and truly responses and is useful for you. And of course, if you found this episode helpful, consider subscribing to our channel. Do not miss the upcoming episodes where we will continue exploring more essential strategies and skills for your personal and professional growth. Until next time. And remember, in the world of negotiation, your approach of your ability to understand and respect others are just as important as number of uncontracted.